You know, sometimes you walk up to uh, <clears throat> a canvas or a drawing board, and if you walk up with no destination in mind, <clears throat> then you have to at least have a path to follow. That means you have to have a destination. So you're going somewhere. The question always is in art is where are you going? You know, what's, what's, what's the purpose of the trip to put something on a piece of paper, a drawing, uh, and or uh, make a sculpture, something that occupies space and has three dimensions and is there in front of you standing, hanging, or swinging, or whatever it is, but ever how it is fixed there, <clears throat> there's always a question of... Uh, of what is it? <clears throat> Drawings came real natural to me at some point in my life. They didn't in, in undergraduate school. They didn't in college. I didn't really draw particularly. I painted pictures, but I didn't draw. When I went to graduate school, I w went in with a dual major, painting and sculpture. I painted for a semester, and then I didn't paint anymore. Uh, I just quit. I quit painting. I think I quit painting because of the concept of focus. What do you focus on? And sculpture, where I went to graduate school, was all-consuming. It was heavy and molten and very labor intensive. Everything we did in graduate school was of that genre. <clears throat> but then I got out of school. Now what? I was good in graduate school at making a thing that people would look at and say, oh, that's really interesting. Oh, that's good. But I never really knew what it was. So I wanted to start making art that I knew what it was. I knew what it was for. I knew why I was doing it. I knew what the content of the piece was going to be. And that took a couple of years, really, to kind of reach a point where I felt absolutely comfortable at that. At first, I would buy three or four sheets of paper, and I was... I was a little worried about messing it up. And then I reached a point where, and this was basically after Charmaine and I moved to, to Splendora in our one room. I would buy a hundred sheets of paper and thought to myself, I can't mess it up. No matter what I do, it's me doing it, so therefore I'm going to trust it. So I started uh, searching for what had been real in my life. I made a lot of drawings about uh, early things, the first memories. Boy, I did a drawing uh, that was embedded in me in 1951 when uh, my daddy was in a head-on car wreck he was in the VA hospital for six months, uh, crushed. Um, my mother brought his suit that he was wearing when he was in the wreck. It was a tan double-breasted suit. And she brought it home in a brown paper bag. Now, I was like in the second or third grade in 1951 when this happened. And my mother told me to take it down to the cleaners. So I did. The next morning, I took a bag, a paper bag, down to the cleaners. As a little kid, I did that. And I put it up and told the guy that my mama wanted it cleaned. And he took a name and everything, and then he pulled it out and looked at it, and it was drenched in blood. There was a tan, double-breasted suit 
that looked like it had been dipped in a bucket of blood. It was, I mean, there were a few tan spots left on it, but not many. And the guy was flabbergasted, you know, and it was a conversation, which I had no answers whatsoever for. I just delivered the suit. I didn't know about the incident in terms of, oh, how did it happen? I have no clue. Still don't. Uh, but years later, I did a drawing about that. Uh, it was called 33 Years Ago Tonight. I stood in gray of morning light. Um, and I was wet with drops of daddy's blood. So that was a drawing. Uh, and I did a drawing about it. And it was a pretty incredible drawing. Ironically, I gave that drawing to Hiram Butler. I mean, it was a very important drawing to me, by the way. All of my drawings are. But I gave it to Hiram Butler. And some years later, as a matter of fact, only a year or so ago, I was in Redbud Gallery in Houston. And that drawing was on the wall. I said, Gus, where, where did you get that drawing? He said, I bought it from a guy that was walking down the street and walked in and asked me if I wanted to buy it. And I said, yeah. he said, yes, I, I said, yes, I'll buy it. He, and he bought it. So now the drawing had made a big loop around and come back and I made contact with it again. And I saw it on Gus Capriva's wall at Redbud Gallery and I bought it. So now I, I actually have the drawing. It's in our mine in Charmaine's possession, which is where it started. And I was extremely happy about getting that drawing back. I have bought several pieces of my art back, um, all done with some pretty serious intent. By the time I got around to the early Splendora years, my intent was really focused. I mean, I was like a laser beam uh, making art. I didn't go down a path uh, with no destination. I always had a destination, but I always meandered to get there. You know, I would very much would be in the free flow of creation, creating a drawing. I wouldn't lift my pencil. I would make lines. I could draw a whole entire scene and never lift the pencil up. I could draw with both hands. You know, I could, I could, I could do, I could, I could draw with both hands, particularly if they <clears throat> mirrored a pattern. If there was a center and the hands were moving in, in similar fashion, then you could draw something with your left hand and you could also draw it with your right hand, which I did. Uh, I, I, I did that quite a bit. I still do. Uh, I love to do it. But I also really, really like, uh, I like my drawings a lot. You know, people, galleries in New York wouldn't show them. Alan Frumkin wouldn't show them when I showed with him in the early 80s. Marlboro Gallery wouldn't show them. Marlboro Gallery said they didn't want to confuse the critics, you know, by showing my drawings. And I thought that was a hair on the insulting side, to tell you the truth. I was kind of insulted by that, you know, because I don't make drawings to uh, confuse a critic or not to confuse a critic. The, the critic has no place in my creative head. Uh, that, that person does not exist for me. Therefore, uh, if they get confused and write something very confusing and even damning, it makes no difference. It's, it's, it's something out there. <clears throat> 
Critics actually bother a lot of artists. A lot of artists get upset about it. I don't, I don't really care uh, one way or the other because it simply means to me that they're looking at something and not really knowing what it is. They have no, they have no way of synchronizing into the pattern that got that drawing into existence. They live in a whole different world. My world is over here and it's a very natural kind of world. And I'm into my own head. They're not there. So they don't, not only do they not get a say, what they do say makes no difference. I had a critic for the Soho News once back when I was in an exhibition at the Whitney. And the, there was a piece in there called uh, uh, Night Vision. It was a sculpture called Night Vision. <clears throat> and night vision was sitting on top of my chopping block turned down this way. Not here where you chop, but here. So the chopped part was in the front. I had used that block for years. And it was soft, chopped where the axe head had gone in the grain and split it. And just it just kept going in and in and in and in. So the whole top of the chopping block was a big fuzz of pieces of fragments of pieces of wood uh, sticking up and it was turned inward where the, the thing would chop into a down into a crevice so I used that crevice as the front door of a house I turned it over the crevice became the front door of the house there was a huge bulbous form coming out of it and it had two eyes that were white, by the way. The eyes were white. But the whole rest of the piece was black. It was dark. It had a big flower coming out of its ear. Out of one ear, a big flower. It had a hand out holding a flower. And the other hand was like this. So it was like open-handed looking at an audience, holding a flower with a flower in the head. And a critic for the Soho News, I think, he liked it. But he said it was beautifully horrific. Whoa. As if in a drug-induced nightmare. So I thought to myself when I read that, I, I kind of laughed and I said, well, man, this guy must have drug-induced nightmares. He knows what that's like, you know, uh, and beautifully horrific. He can actually look at something that's horrific and find some beauty in it. So I thought, well, okay, it's beautifully horrific as, it, as though from a drug-induced nightmare. <laughs> I mean, come on, that was pretty funny coming from my life. My, my, my night vision was really positive. My nights were positive. I didn't have drug-induced nightmares. I had a very positive relationship with the night, you know. So I, I thought it was really strange. But things can be misinterpreted. You know, I have... Uh, a drawing called Ascot Ash. Ascot Ash. What what is that about? What what would that title in, mean? Ascot. There are, I guess you would say, gentlemen who still wears an ascot, which is a cloth around your neck, a scarf, a tucked in kind of scarf, and. It was very, very fashionable, like a hundred years ago, or even more. Um, there was a racetrack in England called um, Ascot, and people would go to Ascot, and they would wear the these scarves. So it became known as that. That that became the the name of that kind of a piece of cloth. And and if a gentleman wore it like that. But it became obsolete. Very, very, very few people, men, wear that anymore. And haven't in the last 35, 40 years or more. 
But how does something disappear, leave the lexicon of the time? And that's what ash is. So Ascot Ash is about something retreating in, in our reality. It didn't disappear, but it got smaller and smaller and smaller and worked its way out. So I did a drawing about that. It's a great drawing. Um, but all of my drawings are like that. I, I should actually spend time with each drawing and going through each one and kind of explaining that in a sense uh, as to their whereabouts, you know, as to what they mean, <clears throat> as to when they were done and the circumstances under which they were done. Because there was always a very powerful kind of mental connection with the drawings. Um, you, you have to really be able to, uh, I would say, take a giant step out of your head to, I do, at least. But I don't step into nowhere, I step into somewhere. And that somewhere is where all of this creative stuff lives. So I would like to open that door. Um, I would actually like to start over explaining some of that in a second video after this one. So I think I will stop here and end this ramble, if you will, um, and then prepare for something that actually is programmed more with specific pieces. So we can walk from drawing to drawing to drawing to drawing and make a connection between all of them. So more to come. <clears throat>